Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I am humbled to be here, but maybe more than humbled, I'm excited, right? I'm excited. Welcome to Journey for Week 2 of Awaken Volume 2. Whether you're here in the room here at Apopka or you're in the room at Lake County, Lake County, I miss you. I'm going to see you next week. Or if you're joining us online, we are so excited to be diving into this. See, here at this church, we are praying and preparing for revival. And this series is all about that. See, Awaken Volume 2.0 is so much about it. It's even got revival in our verse that we're focusing our memory on, our memory verse. It's in Psalm 119.88. And if you'll just say it with me, it's on the screen. Revive me according to your loving kindness. And I don't know about you, but some mornings I wake up and I feel like I need to be revived. In fact, some afternoons I feel like I need to be revived. In fact, generally every day by around 9 p.m., I'd like to be revived, but we really mean that. And last week, we started this series with steps towards revival as written by a man named Evan Roberts. And last week's first step was hunger and thirst for more of God. And we'll get to a second point in just a minute. Let me give you a quick recap. See, last week, Pastor Dustin told us all about Zacchaeus climbing the sycamore tree or the seek him more tree. Great pun. Excellent. That's why he's the master. Just good pun use. That's a good way to preach. I'm just saying. So he climbs to seek him more tree to see more of Jesus. And hunger and thirst will drive us to do a lot to get to the object of our hunger. Maybe even climb a tree. And the next thing Zacchaeus does is he gives away half of his wealth and he pays back those he cheated with four times the amount he cheated them, which is huge. It's a big act of confession and repentance, and it's very public. And I don't think it's an accident that Zacchaeus does this because sin is the one thing that can keep us from being fully awake in Christ. Oswald J. Smith, who authored the book The Revival We Need almost a century ago in 1925, said this, there is only one obstacle that can block up and channel and choke God's power, and that is sin. Sin is the great barrier. It alone can hinder the work of the Spirit and prevent a revival. See, our next step towards revival from hunger is confession. And it's always confession. See, here's the thing. When we get hungry for God, we feel that, that, that desire for more. We will do all sorts of things. We'll cry out to God for guidance. We'll make drastic life changes and drastic overtures of what we want but very rarely do we go to the actual next step, which is confession. And I want you to know there's no other next step after that hunger has been started. And that's not, a, that's not really an answer that people like to hear. See, confession kind of evokes these negative, joyless feelings. It invokes a sense of shame. And the thing is, a decision that doesn't feel pleasant, even though it's good, can really just turn us off from everything in entirely. I recently had to make a, conf a decision that didn't feel very good. My wife, um, who is wonderful and, and in the audience, I won't point her out or embarrass her, she has type 1 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes means she's had it since she was juvenile, since she was four years old. She's had diabetes her entire life, and her pancreas just doesn't work. It doesn't produce a chemical called insulin. So it doesn't regulate sugar or carbohydrates. So our diet should be very, very exact. However, because we are human and we are married, we have the same argument, the same deliberation almost every night. We both get home pretty late. And the first thing we ask each other is, what do you want to eat? And the problem is, Men, you understand. Whatever I say is wrong. <laughs> Whatever she says probably doesn't taste very good. And we're going to end up making a compromise that probably involves a sonic drive through <laughs> And that is not diabetic approved, guys. It's generally a bad decision. And to put things into just a particular frame of mind, all these bad decisions have eventually led us to a place where diabetes is not our friend. 
Back in October, you might have heard Pastor John tell you guys that my wife was in the hospital, and this wasn't because of her diet. It was because of a, a pump malfunction, but it was, a, it was a scary thing to see her in the hospital due to her diabetes, something that made me decide there is one next decision, and while it's not pleasant, I've got to make it. And because I have to have props, right, I brought... What is the emblem of that decision here with me today? It is a hefty black meal prep container. In fact, here at this campus and at Lake County, you will not find one under your seat because I love you and I wouldn't do that to you. I just want you to know that in this meal cup container, we put very healthy things and lean proteins and zucchini and squash, like raw, not the kind of stuff you should microwave at work, sorry. But it's healthy. And because it's healthy and because it's always the choice, we skip all the other bad choices. And we can do that with confession. Instead of having a hunger for God and turning into disillusioned people who just want more, we can have a hunger for God and understand what our next step is. And that's confession. It's a good action that can still feel bad. So the confession and known sin can feel painful and joyless. It can feel shameful because we have regret and guilt due to our sin. And the irony of sin is that it provokes us to isolate ourselves from the only one who can free us from it. See, we build this great wall between ourselves and God. And I really wanted my prop to be a great wall, but it was very expensive. And an even thicker door. We build this giant door that we lock ourselves behind and we leave God locked out on the other side. And confession, no matter how unpleasant, is the key to that big door we've been hiding behind. It's the removal of the obstacle of our sin, our habitual problems, and our self-imposed, I want you to catch that, self-imposed distance from God. Confession, as unpleasant as it might be, has three particular forms. There's private, personal, and public. Private confession is a sin just between you and God. And it's something that we really should be doing almost daily. Because the reality is in our daily prayer and our daily worship, we should be able to bring our sin forward to God with honesty. Not because sin is the focus of our walk with Christ, but instead our love for Christ should be the focus of our walk with Christ. And confession clears out the junk because we need that junk cleared out of the way so we can focus on our love of Jesus and better focus on our calling. Personal and public is a lot like private. It's always paired with private. Not only are we confessing to God, we're also confessing to our fellow man, the people that we've offended. And it's the hardest part because I know confessing to God, we can kind of pretend we didn't hear it whatever he says back. But if I confess to my friends, I will hear what they have to say. It's difficult, but the reality is confession isn't just this apology. It has to involve some form of repentance and restitution. See, if we apologize without an action, it turns into manipulation. And we know how that feels in our relationships. When someone apologizes to us just because they want to get to something comfortable, they don't want the awkwardness of this situation, but they're not really apologizing to get to a whole and healthy relationship. And the problem I have personally is that I'm not good at taking apologies that don't have action, and I'm not so good at giving apologies that have action. I can't tell you how many times in my early marriage I would apologize just to keep my wife from crying. Amen? Amen. You don't know what I'm talking about? I mean, I know what I'm talking about. And the thing is, guys, when we apologize, we have to have in mind that we also need to change. And if you can do that, if your confession can bring also repentance and change, you're going to see restoration brought to your relationships. If you can just remember to change, you will see some restoration in all of your relationships. But the reality is, in our relationship with God, we have some amount of assurance that not only will confession end with restoration, it creates new intimacy with God, and it clears the clutter of our spiritual lives. 
See, our sin drags us down and our addictions drag us down and it can look like guilt and shame and destructive habits and it looks like bondage, but the reality is confession takes sin and turns it into freedom. Instead of being bound by these habits, you're set free. In sin, unconfessed, will it become something exhausting to carry, a weight? In Psalm 32, three through five, David says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. See, despite our fear of punishment, Despite our shame, confession to God brings forgiveness. It brings intimacy and it brings restoration. Hidden sin, though, it brings guilt, exhaustion, and destruction. And the thing is, this, the process of acknowledging, confessing, and repenting from our sin is something repeatedly talked about in Scripture. Probably one of the best explanations I could find was in 1 John 1, 8 through 10. For if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Church, I want you to hear this. While our sins are forgiven and they're in fact being forgiven right now, it's not something we can simply pretend isn't there. We can't simply can say that we're without sin. We, we have to lean into our confession so that we can see just what all we are being forgiven for. And this awareness is not for your guilt, church, but it's for a continued transformation. Christ right now is renewing us in this very room. And if we were to pretend we are without sin, even now, it ignores what Christ is doing by pretending that there's nothing for him to fix. I want you to hear this. God cannot change the person you pretend to be. He is only interested in changing the person you actually are, warts and all. God doesn't deal with masks and he doesn't deal with illusions. And he's not interested in our delusions. There's transformation when we're real with ourself and with God. And all of this leads me to a thought by Dr. Roger Chambers. He was actually a professor of the great pastor, Harvey Carpenter. <laughs> he was kind enough to give me his notes from that class, a class he took like before 1985. So these, this sermon's older than me, you know, Dr. Roger Chambers, you know, I, I, I love it. I think it's great. Um, I think it says a lot about how the word continues to pass from generation to generation, but that's not what I'm preaching about. So his words have been burning in me for weeks, and it's this right here. Confession meets our need for a deep sense of personal sinfulness. See, this blew me away. I put it on a whiteboard. I've been thinking about it over and over. I've been talking about it over and over. Because mistakenly, we put our sinfulness in a box and we pretend that it's being dealt with instead of it being dealt with. Paul knew this in 1 Timothy 1.15. He says, and this is great, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. This is Paul, the guy writing most of the New Testament. This is Paul transforming the world of the Gentiles into a world that loves and pursues Christ Jesus. And he doesn't say I was the worst sinner. He says, I am in the present. He understands because he remembers who he was when he was Saul. Do you remember who you were before you met Jesus? Do you remember who you were before you went to bed last night? Do you remember who you were before you came in the building today? See, I remember not only who I was, but who I am. And who I am is so short of who he is calling me to be. So I need to be aware of my personal sinfulness. I can't put it in a box. I can't delude myself when it comes to where I've come from and what remains in my heart. And we mean well. 
Christ triumphant. We want triumphant Christian living. We mean well when we put that sin in a box. We mean well, but the enemy has a great lie for you, for all of us, and that's that somehow we are good on our own. I tell the congregation of Lake County over and over and over, there is nothing good in me that Christ has not put there. It's just not there. And see, we don't sin because of some sort of accident, because we're normally good people and we just happen to mess up. No, we sin because that's the way we are. It isn't the way we want to be. It isn't the way we were created to be. And thank God it's not the way Christ will leave us. But right now is who it is. I want to share a story with you. And through this story, some benefits of this deep sense of personal sinfulness. It's in Luke 7, uh, 36 through 50. And you can find the page number and the Bibles in your seat backs here and at Lake County on 887 and 888. See, Jesus is at a dinner party at a Pharisee's house. The Pharisee's name is Simon. And Simon's a dignified, holy man, a teacher of some point. And someone crashes this Pharisee's party. In verse 37, we hear a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. I'm just going to go ahead and let you know, PG rated. This is an illusion that she is a sex worker, that she is at the lowest caste. She's not just a woman who made some mistakes. This is someone that society looks down on because of her sinful lifestyle, that it's packed into her very profession. She learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. See, this is a public sign of confession. And it's a deference to Jesus for who he is because the woman is very aware of her personal sin and very aware of who she is, but she's also, unlike the Pharisee, aware of who Jesus is is. So she comes to a party she doesn't belong to, to do something so that she can belong to Jesus. And the reaction of Simon the Pharisee is that he isn't impressed. He actually thinks, asks to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Because nothing is hidden from Jesus, he notes this and he tells Simon his story to illustrate the issue of what is happening, to show our need for a deep sense of personal sinfulness. He starts in verse 41. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. See, Jesus illustrates something incredible here. Our love for Christ is influenced by our awareness of our need for him. And that's the first benefit of this deep sense of our personal sinfulness. It makes us realize that we need Jesus Christ. See, our works cannot alleviate the sin that still tries to consume us. The addictions that we're holding at bay, the temper that comes out when our buttons are pushed, we have to acknowledge that we need Jesus. See, our sense of personal sinfulness isn't so we can feel helpless before our temptation or our past or even our future. Our sense of personal sinfulness is so that we can know that we are saved people in a relationship with a Savior. Man. If we know that, then how much stronger is our bond to Jesus, who was once a friend, but now an essential Savior? See, Jesus' position is shown in this story when he says, you are forgiven. Jesus is not just a teacher. He's not just the dinner guest. He's not a religious figure. He's not just a friend. He's a living sacrifice and the justification for each and every one of us, regardless of our sin, regardless of our origin, regardless of our choices. See, the Pharisee Simon thought Jesus was just a cool teacher. He might have been tempted by Jesus' thoughts or teachings, but he wasn't transformed by it. The sinful woman who crashed that party, she was transformed by Jesus Christ. Amen. She was forgiven by Christ. Simon thought Jesus a friend. The woman thought Jesus a savior. In truth, he's both. But we cling closer to something when you know it can save your life, which reminds me, I'm going somewhere on the 4th of July. I'm going to spend time in Tennessee with my family on a boat, water skiing. And guys, you might've noticed, mine is not a frame for water skiing. 
the most daring this brother gets is these pants. That's it. So I was in Sam's Club. I love Sam's Club. You can buy anything at Sam's Club. And I found this flotation device. And it was about 40 something dollars. And I said, Kelly, I gotta have this. And I clinged it close to my chest. I said, I gotta have it. I got to. And she, of course, said, my father will get you a life jacket. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I ain't risking it. So I bought this personal flotation device. This essential thing for the water because I know how vulnerable I am in the water. And anytime I'm near the water, I'm gonna be clinging to this vest. I'm gonna be wearing this vest, picks to follow. <laughs> and the reality is, guys, if you knew how vulnerable I was in the water, you wouldn't be surprised that I'm gonna be wearing that vest. But how vulnerable are you to your sin? And how much do you cling to Jesus Christ? We cling to the Savior. We text back a friend. Does that make sense? See, a deep sense of personal sinfulness teaches us how to love God and one another. Jesus goes, continuing in verse 44, and he says to the woman, or rather, he turns to the woman and says to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You didn't give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I've entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. See, the Pharisee felt no need for Jesus' forgiveness, but he liked Jesus' teaching enough to keep him around. He felt put together, but he didn't need Jesus. He felt like he was good without forgiveness, and Simon was wrong. And all because he couldn't see his own sin, all he could see in his fellow man was sin. In light of our confession, in light of our awareness of our sinful nature, how can we love anyone less than what they deserve? See, we love God because he first loved us, because he justified us, and he asked us to love as we've been loved. So even if people have let me down, my love should still be for them. And I should have love for God knowing how much he loves us despite the disappointment I may sometimes be. I mean, how beautiful is it that we have God's church, even if people in it can be a little bit ugly, amen? Yeah. amen. The last benefit is a deep sense of personal sinfulness gives us assurance in our salvation. And this is complicated, okay? Because we have assurance in our salvation only if we know what we've been forgiven of. And that's counterintuitive because a lot of Christians inadvertently believe the opposite. Confession makes them feel bad, so they throw it out. They don't want to be reminded of their flaws or their sins or their foibles. Or confession makes them think of punishment, so they avoid it because they don't want to think about God angry. There's a shame conviction paradox, right? Shame is what we feel when we do wrong, and it causes us to hide and defend. Conviction is what we feel when we've done something wrong and it causes us to change. Which one do you think is right? God doesn't want you feeling ashamed. He wants you feeling convicted and convicted only happens when you're willing to confess. And through this conviction and through this confession, we see repentance born not just of our own volition, but because God has stirred it in our very hearts for it. And that gives us assurance. Not this idea that we could somehow be good enough for heaven because we'll never be good enough. See, Christ is good enough to take you anywhere. You're good enough to go just about nowhere. And when I talk about assurance, I think about a hymn. And yes, I'm technically old enough to remember and appreciate hymns. The hymn's Blessed Assurance. And it's the kind of assurance that I'm talking about where you don't need to fear hell, where you don't need to beat yourself down over your sin, but instead lean into the fact that grace is there and confession can clear the obstacle between you and God. I mean, blessed assurance as hymns go was a banger of a hymn. It has a sense of joy, but it also has a sense of why. Blessed assurance. You thought I was going to sing. Nah, ain't going to happen. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my savior all the day long. I hear y'all front row. I hear you. See, blessed assurance tells the story of both my sin and how it's washed away. 
of both my salvation and how it's achieved, of how I need a Savior and how I have a Savior. And it tells your story too. See, Pastor Dustin said it last week, we can't stop an awakening, but we can miss it. We can't stop Jesus, but we can miss him. And Asbury, one of the first things, the, the revival, the outpouring, one of the first things that happened was a young believer stood in a crowd of people and confessed his sin before God. See, revival, be it at Asbury, or be it here, or be it in your living room, or be it in your marriage, happens only after God's people confess and repent. See, I want this to be our story, church. A story of blessed assurance, of people who know that they know that they know that they're broken and sinful, and God wants them anyway that that sin may still be there and may still be getting erased and washed and scrubbed, but God's put something in you. See, we pray for revival, for awakening, because we want a whole church of people here who can say that they're heirs of salvation and that they're purchased of God, that we came here dirty, but we got washed. And you've got a chance right now here at Apopka or out Lake County or online or on a podcast four weeks from now to start a new story, to confess and to repent, where instead of hiding your brokenness or denying it or pretending it's not there, you can confess and you can watch our Savior, King Jesus, put you back together. Today, I challenge you, I invite you, I beg you to try confession, not just out of guilt, but out of love for Jesus and a growing assurance that you don't need to hide your sin because Jesus is bigger than your sin. Church, if you do that, you'll find yourself in the middle of an awakening. Let me pray for you. Tell me, Father, I just thank you for who you are, for your greatness, for your sovereignty, for the fact that you are in fact bigger than my sin, you're bigger than our sin, that you've never seen something that you can't forgive, you've never seen something broken that you can't put together. And I thank you that I'm not good enough because you've removed the pressure from me and the pressure from these people, the pressure from our family to get it right on our own, that we get to lean on you. And part of leaning on you is confessing on how we have it. So Lord, we thank you and we humble ourselves to you seeking forgiveness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.